Before I forget, there is one uh, point to make uh, in terms of notation that I didn't do last time. So if x is a path connected space, which has a fundamental group pi 1 of x0, which is trivial, then we say that x is simply connected. OK. And I guess the first question would be, is this a, this is a well-defined concept? Why is that? Right. So he's saying that the this is well indeed well defined because it doesn't matter what the uh, point, the base point it is that you pick, any other point because the path, uh, the space is path connected, will give you an isomorphic group, and any group isomorphic to the trivial group, of course, is trivial. So this has to do with the space, not with the choice of uh, base points. So this is a important concept to, to know about. So let's say, give me a couple of spaces that are simply connected. Uh, Sorry? Uh, I can't hear. Yeah, RN. RN. Yes, because it's uh, convex, for example. Right? What is another example? Hmm? Yeah, any ball, a cube, convex sets of Rn are simple examples of this. Okay, um, then I mentioned the concept of retract when we proved uh, at the end of the class last time that a, uh, a function, uh, this Brouwer theorem of a fixed point, and so let me formalize that. Um, this pen works. So we have a topological subspace A of a space X with an inclusion I, a map from X to A is called a retract R. Um, if um, A from A the map R composed with I is the identity. Okay, and so the claim, I like, excuse me? Oh, uh, let's see, the R is minus, maybe? Is that better? Yes. Yeah, I'm running out of this ink of the other pen. See if I can keep using this one. So the claim is that um, I star, a uh, lower star, which is a map from pi 1 of x, let's pick a base point x0 that belongs to A. So there's a map from pi 1 of A to pi 1 of x is injective. And uh, the proof of this is quite simple. Once we have the functoriality of the construction of the fundamental group, meaning that not only we associate a group to a space, but we associate homomorphism between those groups. If we have pointed spaces, so in other words, spaces together with a fixed base point and maps that take um, the continuous maps between the spaces that take a base point to a base point. And functoriality also means that if you have a composition of maps, then uh, the resulting maps at, at the group level are also the corresponding compositions. So that is to say, because R I is the identity, it follows that R lower star I lower star 
which is r i lower star. This is the com the, um, func one of the properties of functoriality is equal to the identity of a lower star, and this is the identity um, of pi 1. Okay, because uh, another property of functoriality is that the identity map goes to the identity map. All of these are, we haven't proved exactly, but they're all fairly simple, so I won't do them. But once we know that R composed with I is the identity map at, in pi 1, this implies that I has to be injective. I star. And this, if you uh, go back to what we were doing, uh, we didn't spell it out, but that's exactly um, how we use the fact that we have a retract in that example. Um, right, so for example, um, if A um, if pi 1 of x is not trivial, sorry, if I, pi 1 of x is trivial, in other words, if it's simply connected, and pi 1 of a is not, let's assume all the spaces are path connected to avoid uh, trivialities, then what can we say about A and X? So A is some subspace of X. If this group is trivial, this group is not trivial by assumption, then we cannot have an injection between taking this group into that one. Right? Just a big, a big group doesn't fit into a small one. So that means that uh, you, we couldn't have a retraction. So A is not a retract of X. And uh, a an concrete example of this would be if we take X to be the unit disk and A to be its boundary, the circle. And this is the way exactly we did it last time. Um, there's no retract. I think that's what we did anyway. Um, there's no retract from D to A. So maybe a picture to have for a retract would be something like this. Uh, say if you have a unit disk times the unit interval, and you look at the map that projects down. Um, so this is our x, and you take a to be d. Then the projection down, uh, any point of the disk stays where it is. It just projects to itself, and everybody uh, above it sort of sque uh, gets squashed down. So this is a retract. So multiplying by the unit interval doesn't change the fundamental group. Okay. And there's one other point I want to make, sort of in general discussion. Um, another claim is the following, that if we have the product, the Cartesian product of two spaces, X and Y, and a base point, say, X0, Y0, then in a natural way, this fundamental group is the product of the two fundamental groups. And let me just give you a sketch of what you need to do. It's fairly simple. A uh, map, a path, a loop from, is a map from I to X times Y starting and ending at the base point. And any such map has to be 
of the form x of s, y of s, with x and x s and y s loops into x and into y. So this gives you a way to go from you attach to the homotopy class of gamma the corresponding pair of homotopy classes of these paths x and y and then it's a simple matter to verify that this works um, with homotopy classes and that indeed in that way you get an isomorphism. So that's, we try to build the knowledge of this, this fundamental group and uh, I think it's good to have the sort of theoretical things down, but also get an intuition for how this behaves in spaces that you're familiar with. So you should try to think of various spaces as we incorporate uh, more uh, uh, facts about the fundamental group so that you know how to um, con compute them. Um, it's always a good, um, a good thing to internalize the concepts to be able to compute uh, any, any given concept in, um, in as many examples as you can. Um, so let's discuss one example of this. For example, uh, let's take x and y both to be the unit circle. So the statement is that pi 1 of the circle cross the circle at some base point x0, y0 is isomorphic to z cross z. Um, so that's a um, an abelian group. Okay, so uh, what is a more familiar way to describe S1 cross S1? Sorry? is the torus, right? So you can represent this pictorially like this. And uh, implicit in the, when you go through the proof of this theorem, um, you'll see that this isomorphism here is not a completely abstract thing. Um, we know the pi 1 of S1 is a circle, at least we talked about it and we'll, we'll prove it. And so there is a, you can pick a generator here which for z there's only two generators, right? You have either one or minus one. So this well defined up to an orientation. So let's pick one for this copy and one for this copy. So we have two circles and they are going to map over here and be the generators of say here, one, zero, zero, one. Okay, so um, in, this, in this form of the space, we have a circle and a point and a point in a circle as the two generators of z cross z. And in here, they, um, they say this is the base point. They become uh, a circle that goes along, a loop that goes along one of the circles, okay? And then the other one in the other circle is just the point. And then a cir another circle that goes um, along the other circle and is uh, a point with respect to the first circle, right? Is, is that clear? So these two, let's call them say A and B, um, generate, so if we write it in sort of a additive notation, this would be pi one of the torus at some point Z say. And so, how would, uh, given this fact, how would um, a homotopy class of a path look like? Well, it can do, you know, we've been drawing paths that are fairly simple, but a path could be doing all kinds of stuff. But it's going to be homotopy to something quite simple, something that goes a certain number of times along one of the circles and a certain number of times along the other. Okay, so it will be how many multiples of A and how many multiples of B you have. So if you draw them, you can see some of the pictures in Hatch's book, they will look like um, um, these, 
knots sort of tied around the torus. Okay. Now, um, maybe before we get into more nitty-gritty uh, proofs, I thought I'll show you a picture. Uh, and uh, hopefully, we will get to discuss the mathematics. Or maybe one of you would like to uh, read it and uh, could tell us. And this is a, di a trick that apparently, I didn't know this before, a trick that apparently Dirac came up with. So um, uh, let me say it in words, and then I'll show you a picture of how it works. So you take a belt, OK, and you twist it twice. So fix this end, and you take one end, and you do it two twists. OK, now there's a way to untwist this without moving these two. So, you, uh, you, so you're going to move the thing, but these are, these are going to be, uh, the endpoints are going to be fixed. So this is an example of sort of a homotopy um, and we'll discuss the, the math that goes behind it. I'll, if you like, I'll, send, I'll give you the URL if you want to read. So this is called the Dirac uh, Bell Trick, and it's actually something you can physically do. So you can, if you want to impress your, your friends by home, you can uh, try this trick. And maybe you can impress us if you want to do the trick and, and uh, learn how to do it and come here and you do it. So the first thing this is going to do is actually do the two twists. And then it's going to unravel it by, um, by this uh, homotopy. So first is twisting the thing twice. OK. So that's the belt twisted twice. And now without moving the endpoints, it's going to un twist it. OK, so let me try again. So you could say, well, I mean, it maybe it's an you know, optical illusion. I mean, you know, the, the computer is tricking us. But this, you should try this at home and then see if you can actually do it with a belt. And he's already trying. <laughs> so first, this gets twi twisted once. And now, it gets untwisted without changing, without moving the endpoints. OK, no, well, don't do it now, because otherwise you won't just pay any attention to it, <laughs> what we do next. But um, so tell me what you think this, this means. Why is this? So maybe let me ask a different question. So suppose I twist the belt once, not twice. Can you unravel it? Can you do something like this, moving around and without moving the endpoints of the belt, sort of untwist it? No. no, you can't. And why not? Because you go through the, uh, through the belt, you will go to the downside. It, it's the end of the, uh, it's, it's the second end. But if you twice, to, twice uh, if you twist it twice, you will go again to the upper side. Upper side. Okay, so what he's saying is that if you do it once, you wouldn't because uh, somehow you will get to the other side of the belt, but if you do it twice, you're coming back to the original side. So, okay, can, uh, can you guess a, a more mathematical or a, uh, something in terms of the fundamental group, given what we're discussing? <laughs> OK, well, I mean, it's not completely apparent, but what we'll see is that this has to do with this a space, which has fundamental group Z mod 2Z. It's a group of two elements. And so the fact that you do this twist twice means that you're taking a generator and multiplying it by 2. And in this group, uh, an element by 2 is 0, because it's just a group, you know, the classes are 0, 1, mod 2. And so this thing, although it looked twisted, in fact, it isn't. It is um, uh, up to homotopy is actually untwisted. So this is, I'm not pretending that this is a full proof, but this is somewhat what's behind this. I'm, well, we'll have to, in order to do this correctly, you have to understand exactly what is the space that is involved. 
but I don't want to get into that right now. So let's go back to, to this. So what I thought we could do now is do a bit more um, actual proofs. And so in particular, this thing that I've been talking about for some time, or the pi 1 of the circle. So there's a concept that we're going to discuss now that is very much tied with the idea of the fundamental group, which is the idea of covering spaces. And I think it probably will, if you haven't seen this before, it will come out as something fairly strange. Um, you, you probably are happy with the fundamental group. You can live with the idea that you know, paths, classes of paths is things that you've seen before in calculus as I tried to il il illustrate at the beginning last time. Um, but covering spaces is a bit, more, a bit stranger. So I'll try to motivate it, but let me just say that it will be some, a concept that ultimately is even perhaps more important than the actual fundamental group or it, at the very least, it's very much tied to it. So let me give you an example of a covering map, uh, and then we'll abstract from this example what is it that we expect this to be. So the example is what I was uh, doing last time. So there's a map from R to the circle, which is to send theta to e to the 2 pi i theta, or if you want in more in real coordinates, cosine 2 pi theta, sine 2 pi theta. And this will be an example of a covering map. And I'd like to abstract what are the features of this map that make it so, and how can we use it. And as I was doing last time, and maybe this today will make a little more clear what I was trying to say. In order to visualize this map, I'm going to consider this, the, um, the helix formed by something in an R3 so that the first coordinates follow the circle. But the third is the angle itself. So visually what we have is a cylinder. This is sort of the theta direction. And it's sitting above the unit circle. So the map. Um, so think of this vertical line as R, and the map uh, takes R to, uh, to the circle. But instead of just keeping track of the angle, we, um, we sort of think of theta as the height in the cylinder, but we also keep in track of where it it looks down below uh, by describing this elix. Okay? So one way to think of what this is is a way to describe the angle of any point in the plane. So if we have um, this point here, it has a certain angle, but the angle has an ambiguity, and we sort of, rather than making a choice, which is the typical thing, you maybe take between minus pi half and pi halves, or zero to two pi, or something like this. Now we take all possible things. And so above this point, we're going to have all possible angles. And as we discussed before, all possible angles differ from any given one by an integer, or rather an integer times two pi. So, but I'll, I'll keep the factor 2 pi out, so um, 
up to dividing by 2 pi, the ambiguity will be an integer. Okay, so I want to understand topologically how the properties of this map. And hopefully this will make clear what we exp why we define a covering uh, the way we will. So the, the point is this. Here's a point and its pre-images. If, if we pick a little interval, a little open set around this point, a little neighborhood, and we pull it up, we can have these, around each one of these pre-images, little intervals that look exactly like the one below. So more precisely, this map P, let me write it like this, there exists a neighborhood U of any point downstairs such that the inverse image of that open set, so here's our U down here, let's say any point Z down below, so what is the pre-image consists of all these little intervals that are disjoint. So it's a disjoint union over some indexing set, which for us are going to be the integers, of open sets U alpha. And such that if we take the map P, so here's map P goes like this, and restricted to any one of these given subsets U alpha, it maps homeomorphically to U. So what this, if we want to say this in words, it says that you can pick a little neighborhood of the point so that above any pre-image, you'll see exactly that same little open subset around each one of its pre-images. The same meaning that the map P takes from one to the other in a homeomorphic way. Okay, and I hope this is clear from this um, picture for the case of R and the circle. I mean, what is, um, what you would do, uh, concretely you would define the, the ar argument or the angle of the point on the circle, and if you take a small enough neighborhood of a point, the angle is a perfectly good invertible function, um, and so that is what this is. So if you have a point that is, let me see. So if we want to do this not with a helix, let's say I take this point. This is my Z. Okay, so here's R. So if I do it not in 3D but just in 2D. Okay, so I will have, for example, so this is 0, 1, 2, etc inside R. So this measured in the usual way has an angle of um, pi over uh, 2 pi over 8. Did I do that right? Um, okay, so it means that one of the possible angles is the here at 1 8. So if I take a little neighborhood, we'll have a little neighborhood about that, and then the similar one around one more. Etc. So the pre-image of that little segment around this point is little segments that look exactly the same around 1 8, 1 8 plus 1, 1 8 plus 2, 1 8 minus 1, 1 8 minus 2, etc. Right? 
So this is the basic property of a covering. Okay. And it will have, as I said, although maybe not quite clear yet, a very um, close connection to the idea of um, the fundamental group. Okay, so let me give you some more examples of coverings. The one R to S1 we already uh, discussed. Let's take the following map from S1 to S1. Take the map, take Z to Z squared. Think of Z as a complex number. And, um, and square it, or if you like to think of this in terms of um, angles. It will double the angle. But it's, it's just quicker to write it in terms of complex numbers. So I claim that this is a covering. Okay. So a covering map. is a map from one space to another, y maps to x, with the property that any point of x has a neighborhood whose pre-image is a disjoint union of neighborhoods, which are in homeomorphic relation via p to the one below. So there's quite a lot of things crammed into that definition. So let's uh, look at this example. So here we have the circle. And uh, the map is a square map. So if we think of this, of the circle upstairs, if we move along the circle once, what happens below? You move twice as fast, you go twice around. So if I move below once, what happens upstairs? We only do half, okay? So what um, then we can say is say, let's try to find um, this decomposition into disjoint unions of the preimage. So if I take a little neighborhood here, so uh, let's say this is, let me do it in an angle so you can see it. So this is one, this is S1 and S1. This is the point one in the sense of complex numbers. So what are the preimages of one? One and minus one. One and minus one. So there's another preimage here. Okay, so um, this little neighborhood will be here, half its length, but it will also be here. Okay, so the pre-image of a little interval around one will become these two intervals, in this case around one and around minus one. And the same thing happens for all the other points. So maybe if, in a, if I, to describe it this a little more graphically, like in this example, what we can say is that we have the circle, and then the circle going around twice. But once you go to, the, to this, this should be the same as that. So it is the circle, but it's been I sort of unravel it so that it looks like um, a little piece of that helix above, two loops of that helix.
So if I look at one, we would have um, one here, and then minus one there, and the little interval will look like that. So it's another. OK, so this is another example of a covering. And um, the now we're going to prove certain things about coverings that will hopefully also uh, convince you that this is a worthwhile definition. And so this now will, will make the connection between this concept and the concept of um, fundamental group. Okay, <clears throat> so all throughout this discussion, we're going to have a covering map, or simply a covering. And giving a path gamma from the interval to i. So this is a path together with um, some y0 in y, which is in the pre-image of our base point below. So this is a path, uh, sorry, uh, say is a loop at x0, which is in x. So we have an x and x0, a loop starting and finishing in x0. And we have now a covering map. And I want to deduce something about this. So <clears throat> let's go back to our basic example, which to guide the intu intuition. Um, let me try to say it in, in words and by moving my hands. And then we'll, we'll do it. We'll prove it more formally. So. Let's just look at a very simple path down below. So for example, let's say we um, take the loop that goes counterclockwise twice. Okay? So that's a loop down in the x. Right? So this in our notation, this is x, and this is y, and this is our map p, the covering. So what we could do is pick any preimage of the base point. Okay? And then follow, follow upstairs the point. Okay? So when it gets to be once, it's right on top where it was, but it didn't close. Upstairs, it didn't close. You do it again, and you go two steps up. So what we did is this loop that went around twice, we unravel it to make something that goes twice in this he helix. Okay? So what that, we can say what was going on is that we lifted this path down below to a path in the covering. So we basically stretching out the loop below into something that is not going to be typically close upstairs. And how, do you, how would you prove this? Well, in this particular case, it's just a matter, you basically do it step by step. So if you move a little bit downstairs, you move a little bit uh, downstairs, you move a little bit upstairs. Then you look up below again, you move a little bit, and you keep going. So you sort of can do it by little steps. And um, you cannot do it, you cannot sort of take the entire path and move it up because it's not a, there's no inverse to this map, but there's locally an inverse. So each little piece can be locally lifted and in a such a way that they, these little pieces get pasted together. And that's um, what we're going to now prove more precisely rather than by just hand-waving. So what's the statement? 
So this is the lifting property of coverings. So we have a loop below, and we want to lift it to a loop upstairs. Okay. So the statement is, there is a unique path, gamma twiddle, that is a path. It goes from I to this space Y with the property that is a lifting, which means that if you project it down, it looks like Sorry, it looks like the path we started with. So, so think of uh, this map as sort of, a, if you like, as a shadow. You have the shadow of a path below, and what we're doing is seeing where it came from. What is the shadow of? Okay. So this means that this is the actual path upstairs. When you project it down, what you see is the path you started with, gamma. And uh, this will not completely pin down the path. You have to start somewhere. So we're going to declare that the beginning of the path is our favorite pre-image y0. So the point is you, start, you have an x0 here. You pick a pre-image somewhere. Okay? And then from then on, you can lift it up or down. I mean, whatever it does. But you lift it starting from that point on. So. The, the upstairs, we have a loop. Upstairs, we typically don't. And this interplay is going to be fundamental to understanding things about, um, cover, um, about fundamental groups. OK, so I will follow um, Fulton's um, description, which is, I think, I mean, there aren't that many variations on the theme, so um, Hatcher most likely does something similar. I just found it a little easier to read. So let's, we're going to so do this in a formal way, but if you like, keep the picture of the helix and the circle in mind to see what's going on. So consider, um, so let me use a name that Fulton uses. So call u a open in x as in the definition of covering. Call it um, evenly covered. I think that's what he says. Yeah. So the definition of covering says that each point has an evenly covered neighborhood. There's a little open set containing the point whose pre-image is a disjoint union, et cetera, et cetera. So call those things evenly covered so we don't have to repeat um, the description that many times. So consider the collection of all evenly covered subsets of x. Um, actually, let's do that. But let's bring back for each one the pre-image by the path gamma. So gamma is a continuous function from i to x. So it brings back any open set to an open set of I. So this gives us an open set covering of the interval I. By the property of covering, every point um, um, of X has such an open, uh, has a, has a open, evenly covered neighborhood. The map gamma takes I to some subset of X. So um, if you pull back, um, the open sets that are um, in the image, other, all the others are going to give you the empty set. Uh, you're going to get a collection of um, open subsets of I. 
And they cover all of I because some point of I has to go somewhere. And so in the image, there'll be an evenly covered um, subset that contains it. So this is a uh, covering. Unfortunately, it's the same word. Um, so it's a collection of open subsets of I covering, containing every point. Is this clear? Yeah? OK. So what uh, then Fulton uses is uh, something called Lebesgue's lemma, which is a simple fact of point set topology. So this is a key sort of technical tool for this purpose. Have you seen this lemma? So what does it say? Can you tell me what it says? Perfect. So let me repeat for the, for the camera, for, for posterity. <laughs> What's the statement, as he outlined it perfectly? So for any uh, open cover of a compact metric space, so a collection of open sets whose union is the whole space in question, there is a epsilon, say, uh, such that any uh, uh, set of any open subset of diameter less than epsilon it's inside one of the sets of the cover. Okay. There is such an epsilon, small enough so that every one of these little sort of balls of radius epsilon, so to speak, in the metric space are inside one of the subsets of the open cover. Okay. So this will um, mean that we can um, get a subdivision finite subdivision of the interval i, let's say 0, t0, so equal t1, tn equals to 1, such that if we look at the image of the interval from ti minus 1 ti, it's inside one of the um, one of the uh, evenly covered sets. Say, call it UI evenly covered. Okay. So, to lift it, we start with the interval T zero, T one. So this is i equals to 1 to n. OK. So t0 is 0. Um, you define gamma 0, gamma total of gamma 0 to be y0. That's what we want. We, want to, we had to start somewhere, so we, we've chosen where we start. So that's this. Um, second property that we are we have as a hypothesis okay so now from t0 to t1 the image of gamma which is some little path in the space downstairs in x is sitting exactly inside a open set which is a evenly covered subset so this little open subset has a preimage, all these layers, all of which are bijectively, each one of them bijectively uh, um, related by P to the one below. So I landed in exactly one of those. So now what I do is I take the corresponding inverse of P, this local inverse of P, to lift it up. Is that clear what I'm, what I'm saying? So we have 
we ended up with a little, well, it starts here. This is why this is um, x0. OK, so this, let's say this is x1 is this. If you want to fix ideas, let's say gamma of ti is xi. OK, so this is inside the interval u1. OK, and this interval, sorry, this uh, open, let me do it again, x0, x1, this is u1 is evenly covered, so, I mean, this may be a little misleading because it doesn't have to be sort of discrete, but I can't draw something disjoint and uh, with a bigger cardinality very easily. So, let's say y0 is here. Okay, this is my chosen pre-image of x0. So, p maps each one of these little pancakes down below exactly in a homeomorphic way. So once I decide which of the pancakes to consider, there is a bijection back. There is a homeomorphism back. So I can lift it by just taking sort of P inverse restricted to uh, that particular slice. Is that, is that clear? So by this local inverse, which is guaranteed by the definition of covering, I can take this path down here, gamma, a little piece of gamma, and lift it up exactly. Well, it's homeomorphism. You can sort of if we draw it. It will maybe deform it a bit. But it has an exact copy of it in the corresponding slice upstairs. OK? And now what do we do? So we lifted a little piece of the path. And now we repeat. We repeat the same, same argument, but now apply to x1 and the interval t1 to t2. The interval t1 to t2 is sent over by gamma to some other um, open subset uh, u2. And uh, the same argument applies. And I start off with um, y1. And of course, you have to convince yourself, verify that th this process um, is such that this gluing of these maps at the end of the day gives you something continuous. So now, iterate. So we would have some, um, I think I, this is, yeah. So I would have x1, u2 x2, and then a local inverse um, started at y1, that will connect to y2. And so I keep doing this until I get to the end of the interval. So do until done. Okay, so what this then showed, what is it that we were trying to do? We were trying to show that, well, we showed the existence of a lift. So this covering condition precisely allows us, in a very um, clean way, it sort of captures what is needed to make sure that we, if we have a path downstairs, we can lift it to some path um, upstairs. So a loop downstairs turns into some path upstairs once you fix an initial point. Okay, now I'm claiming a little more. I'm saying that the path that lifts one below is unique. So once you declare where it begins, then the thing is completely um, determined. Okay. And uh, there is something to prove because in the proof we use the Lebesgue lemma to divide the interval into pieces. What if I had chosen 100 pieces instead of 10? Uh, what would I get? Would we get the same path? 
So the uniqueness does require a proof, but it's not hard. So let's uh, check the uniqueness. The, I think what um, sort of one sees the, the beauty of abstraction, you know, all of these notions took a long time to sink in, to get reduced to these, you know, essential things. I mean, um, if you try to read literature of topology or even before topology, um, it would be uh, much, much harder to, to understand what they were trying to say. So uh, for uniqueness, we can do a little bit more generally, which doesn't hurt. So we want to show that this path that we constructed upstairs, gamma tilde, is actually a unique path given all these constraints. So let's say we have z mapping to x. And let's say z is a connected space. So for us, z is, at the moment, the interval. 0, 1, but it doesn't hurt to do it in general like this. And so instead of a map, then, uh, sorry, instead of a loop, we just have a map um, F. Okay, and um, suppose we have two lifts, F1 twiddle and F2 twiddle. So these are maps that have the property that projected down, they look the same. Okay, so, so to speak, the shadows down in X look the same. They look like F, the one we started with. So they lift F. That's one way to describe it. And, um, So this one point, and the other point is, let's say that F1 twiddle and F2 twiddle agree at some point in Z. Okay, <clears throat> so these are, we have a map below from a space Z to X and then two lifts of that map to the covering, and that these two maps to the lift, the one below, agree at one point, then the conclusion is that they agree everywhere. So then the conclusion is, then F1 twiddle is actually equal to F2 twiddle. Okay. And this will, of course, prove the uniqueness of the other, what we were really trying to prove, if we apply this to the, um, the interval i, okay? And if the function f uh, was the loop, then this common value would be, say, f1 of 0, f1, um, yeah. Yeah, that's what uh, one of the conditions that we had, is that um, we fix one of the given um, init the initial points, so we have two such, is, will be exactly the statement. Anyway, so the proof of this is along the lines of this kind of abstract stuff that you don't really know what you're doing, but some other things kind of proves itself. Um, so we're going to strongly use the fact that the Z is connected. You easily can see that this will be completely wrong if we didn't have that. So to prove that... Um, the functions agree everywhere. We're going to look at this subset uh, of Z where they agree. And we're going to show that it is both open and closed. And then what? Sorry? Ah, good. We need to verify that the subset is also non-empty. So we're going to use the fact it's connected, as pointed out. Uh, if you have an open and closed set that is non-empty, then it's the whole thing. And it's non-empty because 
we are requiring it. Okay, so that will. So what we need to do then is verify that the subset is closed, or where they agree is both open and closed. Okay, so. Um, Okay, so take an evenly covered, sorry, this pen, I'm going to run out of ink here. Take um, U to be an evenly covered um, neighborhood of F of Z0. Right, so if C0 is some point in X, it ha every point in X has a evenly covered neighborhood by the hypothesis of coverings. Okay. And um, so P inverse of U is a disjoint union of subsets U alpha with the properties that we know. Um, let's call y0 to be the common value of f1 twiddle in this point z0. Okay. And now um, let's do uh, let's do a little picture so we get some some of our bearings. This is say sort of a picture of x. This is um, f of z0. Maybe we'll call it x0 if we need to, just to keep our uh, mind focused. And then each one of these has these various slices upstairs. OK, and so um, actually what I'd like to do is the same for some x. So if I have an arbitrary x, Um, which is equal to f of z for some z in the set z, then there are these neighborhoods. And let's say this is the value of f twiddle of z down here, and this is the value of f2 of z. So they're sitting above x. Uh, so actually, maybe this is what I meant to do with an arbitrary z. OK. So we pick a z in the space z, look at this value x, look at a open neighborhood of f of z, which is x. Okay, and upstairs, f1 twiddle and f2 twiddle are going to be mapped to some pre-image of x, which may or may not be the same. We're trying to prove that they are the same. But they're sitting inside their own little neighborhood that covers the neighborhood below u. So this is some, let's call it u1 and u2. Okay. So let's look at um, f2 twiddle inverse of u2. That's some open uh, neighborhood of z intersect with f1 twiddle inverse of u1, which is another open neighborhood of z. So this is an open neighborhood of Z. <clears throat> so let's see. If F2Z twiddle is not equal to F1 
fill Z. Let me call this V. Then um, it means that um, U2 is not equal to U1. These two neighborhoods are neighborhoods of two different points. Uh, we can take them small enough so that, um, that that's the case. And um, F2 twiddle and F1 twiddle are di different in all of V. Yeah, U1 and U2 are disjoint. And so if, if they contain different points, they are different. So, okay. so either they are the same, but in which case um, X, um, Y1 and in the image of F2Z and F1Z twiddle should be the same. So if they are not the same, the, 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 subset, the subsets are this different, the uh, open neighborhoods. And the pullback of the intersection by each function will give us an open neighborhood V, which gets sent over by F2 twiddle and F2 1 twiddle to these two separate things. And so the functions are different in both, in all of the, sorry, in all of the subsets. So if they happen to be the same, then U2 is equal to U1 and um, F2 twiddle is equal to F1 twiddle on all of V. Is that right? Because this is, we're using that, um, they're mapped to the same function. Anyway, I'm, I'm about to get myself confused, so I'll leave it at that. I think I'm saying the right thing. You should verify it. But the point is then that um, the subset where they're equal, every point of the, uh, uh, if you have a point where the functions agree, you have a neighborhood where they agree. And if you, have, if you have a point where they don't agree, you have a neighborhood where they don't agree. So that tells us that where they agree and where they don't agree are both open sets. And as we said before, that that's, the proof, OK? All right. So um, OK, so what have we proved? Let's go back and digest this. We proved that um, given any loop downstairs, when you have a covering, you can use the covering to lift up that loop. And it will give you, once you fix a starting point, some path that is typically not going to be closed, is not going to come back to the same spot. And uh, what we should think of this is sort of an unraveling of the path below. And so if we think, for example, of the circle and the, um, and the helix, this is precisely this unwinding of the, um, of the path below, the loop below, makes it into something um, that now sort of doesn't sort of go around itself. And this will be an extremely useful tool to understanding the fundamental group of a space. And um, now for this to be useful for the fundamental group, we don't only want to lift paths but we also would like to say that if we have two paths below that are homotopic, when you lift them, which we know we can do uniquely, they're also homotopic upstairs. So this will allow us to uh, deduce things about homotopic classes, not just about paths. So there is a corresponding statement then about lifting homotopies. OK? 
Okay, so I think I'll state it and I'll leave it to you to prove. I will give you a lift, list of exercises, I think, next time so you can work on. And uh, I'm sure I don't have to repeat it, but the only way to learn all this amount of stuff that you are seeing so quickly is to do a lot of exercises and you, know, you have to work through examples on your own. So you know, I'll give you the exercises and I'll look at what you write as solutions, but this is not for me, this is for you. This is something you should do just to get a, a hang on what, um, what is being developed and uh, make sure you sort of internalize it in your own words, in your own way. Okay, so what's the statement? Lifting homotopies. And if you look in Hatcher, he does this all in one go, which is fine, but I, I and then deduces a slightly bigger result, the two things that we are doing today uh, from the big one. I think it's a little easier to understand one by one, so that's how we're doing it. So what we have is again a covering, and you still have to be convinced as to why this concept is actually of some use, but hopefully you're beginning to see it. So this is a covering. And um, what we want to do is lift a homotopy So we have a map F from, um, I'm going to try to keep my notation straight, um, I times I to X. And we think of what happens at time T equal to zero as a path, path gamma zero. Okay, so we have a function of the square into x and uh, time t equal to zero, I'm thinking of time going up like this, is what we have there. This is some path gamma zero. And we know how to lift that, so there is a unique lift gamma zero twiddle of gamma naught um, through some uh, y zero. Let me make sure I'm giving you the right hypotheses. Okay, so this is from our previous our previous uh, construction, and so the claim is that there exists a unique uh, lift. F twiddle, which is a homotopy to Y, so of course I never say this, but all the maps that we consider are continuous unless uh, mentioned otherwise, such that at time t equal to zero, it is the lift of our path. Okay. And um, 
it actually is a lift of f, namely if you project it down, you get back the f you started with. So what this will allow us to say is that if we have downstairs not just two paths, but two paths that are homotopic, then we can lift the initial path and it will uh, give you a homotopy between um, lifts um, of each one that you have below. So you can lift the entire homotopy to Y, not just the paths themselves. Okay? So if you think um, now instead of having an initial point, which would be the case of a path below, you have an initial path. And um, once you have a lift of the initial path, then you have a unique way to sort of continue it to, um, in a way that covers what um, the sort of homotopy that you did of the path below. Is that, does that make sense? I don't think I want to explain it too much. I find myself out of training, and by this time I'm too tired to think too clearly. So <laughs> I think I'm, I'm going to leave it at this. But um, the, in words, what we're doing is not just lifting paths, but lifting homotopy or between paths. And this will um, allow us to um, do um, uh, various things with the fundamental group um, so in particular, and this will likely be the last concept we'll discuss today. So in particular, um, if we have, say, um, so gamma 1 of S is the path at times 1. So we have these two paths, gamma 1 and gamma 0, below. So this is by hypothesis equal to gamma 0. So these are two homotopic paths. Um, and so gamma 1 twiddle of S and uh, gamma 2 twiddle of uh, 0 of S are lifts of these. And by the um, construction is such that they start at the same point, starting at y0. Because these lifts, so each one of these paths could be lifted as we did before, starting of, if we start at a, at a given point, there's a unique lift. This is what we did before. But because they were homotopic downstairs, and we just at least stated that we can also lift the corresponding homotopy upstairs, it means that these paths are homotopic in the usual sense of the word. So what this means in particular is that the value of these paths at 1 is the same. Okay, <clears throat> So let's think of what this means in terms of, of, the, um, of the circle and the helix. I've said before that, well, so let's try to now match the two things that we did, sort of this abstract construction of lifting a little bit at a time with Lebesgue's lemma and so on. With the, with the property of the covering map as our basic tool. And then what we are more familiar with of the circle and the helix is things that we can do with uh, just calculus. So, um, so what would be the meaning of this value in the, in the case of the circle and the helix? Well, we have a path on the circle. And then we can lift it. 
And as we said before, if we start somewhere, it's that some angle of the initial point. And when it ends, it has to be some angle uh, modulo 2 pi, uh, so 2 pi times an integer. So the difference between the beginning and the end has to be some integer, right? So each path has associated to it a unique integer, which is the winding number of that path. So for the case of x equals to s1, y equals to r, um, gamma 0 twiddle of 0 is some angle of x0. And in fact, so is gamma 0 of 1. So the difference is um, some integer. Well, if I do angles, it will be some integer times 2 pi. So what this says is now if I take downstairs a path that is homotopic to gamma 0, and I lift it, starting exactly the same place, so I picked as the initial angle the same one as I did before, then when I lift it, I'm going to end up exactly in the same spot. Okay, so what this says, so this is called the winding number of gamma zero. And it doesn't matter where you start because everything will move the, uh, the same amount if you choose a different starting point. So the winding number, so homotopic paths, in S uh, loops in S1 have the same homotopic, homotopy, sorry, same, sorry, winding number. Namely, take the path, get it lifted by starting anywhere you like, and look as to where it ends, where is the difference between where it ends as to where it began. That's some integer. That integer is the winding number of the path. And no matter what path you take in, in the homotopy class, these statements that we're discussing show, you, show that it is the same number. So um, if you like, then, well, we can interpret our discussion of liftings as some sort of generalization of winding, winding numbers. So if you have a space below and some covering space, then um, this uh, procedure gives you a way to assign a quantity, which is where a path that you lift ends. And that point where it ends um, depends only on the homotopy uh, class of the path below and what is your starting point upstairs. OK, so that is a very crucial uh, fact that we can manipulate, uh, we can do this type of analysis of winding numbers without using differential forms, without using the real numbers. This is an abstract way of this doing something that it is the usual one in the case of R. Okay, so what we would like to say then is that um, now it should be clear how we can formalize what we've been discussing about the circle. Say you take S1 and the point 1 as your base point. Then we want, we've been saying that this is isomorphic to Z. OK, so what should be the map? Well, you, it's the homotopy class of a, pa, a loop gamma will be sent to what? To the winding number of gamma. Let's call this w of gamma 0. And it's around 0, but it's since we, I'm, ignore, I'm going to ignore that for the moment. And 
the argument that we had before says that this is a well-defined number. It doesn't depend on the choice of path in the homotopy class. And um, I claim that this is an isomorphism. Um, and we still have a few little things to do to check that. But let's see how, uh, what we can do now. Um, so for example, how do we know this map is surjective? What does that mean that the map is surjective? It means if I give you an integer, you should be able to produce a homotopy class of a loop that has that winding number. We just go around n times in the circle, just normal, at a normal speed. That will have winding number n. I guess we'll, we would have to verify that, but it's uh, pretty, I think, pretty intuitively clear. And what we still would have to do is to show that this is injective, so that um, if you have something with one nine, winding number 0, it is 0, and then that is a homomorphism, so that um, when you multiply homotopy paths, the uh, winding numbers add. But this is something I'll leave for next time. So I'll show you uh, only a few pictures uh, of um, so this to be continued. In other words, to complete the proof of this. And you may be argue, thinking, well, we did all this covering space. That looks like a lot of stuff for proving something we can probably do it with our bare hands. But I th hope you agree that, um, that this, in fact, is a powerful tool that will allow us to do a lot more things than just uh, dealing with the circle, um, and, um, which is what we're going to do. But So in some sense, the covering spaces are a lot in some sense, a lot more interesting than the fundamental group itself. So I'm just going to show you, just to give you a flavor of the richness of covering spaces, um, what Hatcher has a discussion will I suggest you look at. So, um, see how we do. Okay, so if we look at that space, the figure 8, which we'll spend some time discussing, um, so there's two paths here, the A and the B, and you cannot shrink either one of them, and at least I'm, we discussed last time and I mentioned that. Basically, no, if you, any path consists of a word in A, A inverse in B, and B inverse. You either go in A in its correct direction or in the opposite direction, or you do the same with B and B inverse. And then, so you, you, you can, a path would be sort of do A and then B, and maybe do a inverse, A five times, you know, any word in A, A inverse, B, B inverse will be a path. And in fact, any path is uniquely determined by that word. There are no relations other than the obvious one that A, A inverse is one and B, B inverse is one. In fact, the fundamental group is the free group in A and B. Okay, so, but now if you look at this, uh, you can also think of this as a, as a sort of a graph. You have one vertex in the middle, and then there's one edge that comes out that looks like A, and one edge that comes in that looks like A. So this portion of A and this portion of A. And then one uh, edge that looks like uh, that has a label B coming out, and then in the uh, label B that comes in. So let me show you a few of possible coverings of this space. So, so far, we don't have a whole lot of examples of coverings. We have S1, we, have, we said we have R or S1 is covered by S1 by this square map, and you can easily see that you can have a covering with the cube map or the fourth map and so on. And that's basically all you can have for the circle, but for this space, which is just two circles put together, uh, things become a lot more interesting and you have a lot more covers. So these are some of the covers you can have. So, okay, so each one of these spaces is actually a cover of the figure eight. And what is it that determines them? How would you construct them? Well, let's look at this one. So you have a number of vertices. And the thing to focus is that around, if you look around a vertex, you have 
an A coming in, a coming out and coming in, and a B coming in and coming out. So any graph that has that shape is actually a covering of the figure eight. So coverings could have quite a lot of interesting things in it. So for example, we see these little thingies that look like snowflakes. So uh, at each point, there are these four things, and, and you have to keep doing this. So they don't um, close back. It, it sort of continues in, uh, at infinity. And uh, the more interesting one, so you can take this to each one of these that is here has a fundamental group that is not trivial because there, there are little loops in them that you cannot shrink. But there is, you can sort of go all the way and get a covering that doesn't have any loops that, um, that you cannot shrink. That, so you can have a, um, a covering that is simply connected. And that's what it is. Okay, so if you take the circle, it has a covering, namely R. And R is simply connected. Okay? And so we'll see that all most natural spaces have a covering that is simply connected. And that's going to be the mother of all coverings. Any cover will be in between the big one and the space you have. And um, so that's called the universal cover. And here's the, the universal cover of the figure eight knot. And for those of you who have seen Galois theory, I don't know how many of you have. Have you seen Galois theory? Some, some of you. So this actually will make this theory become very much like Galois theory. And the universal cover will play the role of the algebraic closure of a, uh, of a field. Okay, and uh, so we'll see how groups uh, that look like the uh, like the Galois group uh, come in, and the Galois group uh, is replaced by the fundamental group. All right, so enough mystery, and uh, we'll continue on Thursday, I believe. <laughs>